I'm going to be in Luke chapter 16 this morning. I uh, uh, a little bit uh, excited. I don't know if you can tell when I'm excited or not. <laughs> so I have to tell you when it happens. But uh, uh, about this, this morning's uh, passage, because um, uh, one of my favorite times to, to preach teach is when I've learned something and uh, myself and that's not to say that uh, uh, that's a rare occasion because uh, like, I, like I know everything and it's very rare that I learn something kind of no it's not that at all uh, but uh, the word of God is very rich and you can know everything that you think you can know about a subject or about a passage and then all of a sudden the light bulb clicks on and then, then you there's something else there that you didn't see before. And those times are exciting for me and, and makes it to where I'm excited to uh, deliver the message to you. And, and uh, this is one of those subjects that was very, has always been very confusing to me. Uh, not the subject, uh, that's not entirely correct, but rather the, the example. Uh, some people call this a parable. Uh, uh, but... Uh, Jesus doesn't identify it as a parable, and neither does Luke. Uh, so, and, and also, it begins by saying there was a certain rich man. Now, in my way of thinking, whenever Jesus says there was a certain individual, he means just that. There's no reason to think that that individual didn't exist or that it's not a real story that didn't happen. I believe that these, both this and the story of the rich man and Lazarus, which, which they go hand in hand here in his teaching, uh, or a real events that happened to real people. Uh, or else he would say, he wouldn't say this was a certain man. He would just say there was a man, wouldn't he? Just say there was a man that did thus and thus. But no, he didn't say that. He said there was a certain man. Uh, so he wants to be clear that he's talking about a certain individual when he uses this. But this is what many people call the parable of the unjust steward. I refrain from calling it the parable. And just It's the, about the unjust steward. And for myself, it was has always been very confusing, and uh, it's still not crystal clear to me. But there's some things I wasn't understanding before that I do understand now, and uh, and I hope I can uh, share that with you this morning uh, effectively. And um, we'll begin reading in verse one. It says, "And he said also uh, unto his disciples." Now remember, he just got through teaching about. Uh, the value of of a lost soul, and you know that person's value to God, and he likened it to a, a person that had lost a coin, or a, a, a person who had a hundred sheep and lost one. And then he told the par the parable uh, or, or the, of the uh, uh, or it might not have been a parable. He told the story of the lost son, uh, what we call the prodigal son. And uh, it had to do with wealth, but that wasn't the main uh, topic of that, of that uh, teaching at the time. But if you remember, uh, one son, the younger son, got his inheritance and he went and squandered every penny of it to where he had nothing. And then you had the older son, the elder son, who he didn't do that. Uh, he, he kept his inheritance but he was very bitter, wasn't he? Uh, and, and either one of those are not good, but Jesus is going to address the issue of wealth in this next teaching. And, and, and it comes on the heels of that prodigal son story, which also dealt with wealth. And I think that's why it, uh, it's arranged in this way. And it says in verse one, and he said also unto his disciples, there was a certain rich man which had a steward. And the same was accused unto him that he had wasted his goods. And he called him and said unto him, How is it that I hear this of thee? Give an account of thy stewardship, for thou mayest no, be no longer steward. Then the steward said within himself, What shall I do? For my Lord taketh away from me the stewardship. I cannot dig, and to beg I am ashamed. I am resolved what to do, that when I am put out of the stewardship, they may receive me into their houses. So he called every one of his Lord's debtors unto him, 
and said unto the first, How much owest thou unto my Lord? And he said, A hundred measures of oil. And he said unto him, Take thy bill and sit down quickly and write fifty. Then uh, said he to another, And how much owest thou? And he said, A hundred measures of wheat. And he said unto him, Take thy bill and write fourscore. And the Lord commended the unjust steward because he had done wisely. For the children of this world are in their generation wiser than the children of light. Now, this is a very confusing story because of what he says later also uh, when he talks about making friends of righteous mammon. And we'll do that. We'll cover that in just a moment. Uh, and then at the very end, he says you cannot, be, you cannot serve God and mammon. And so when we see this story, it's, it becomes kind of confusing. Or at least it always has to me, and I think it has been to others. Uh, as to uh, what's going on here. Um, because it looks, for, for one, if you're a, if you're a landowner a, uh, of a large estate uh, that deals in goods, you don't, I don't know what kind of goods it was that he had. Uh, I don't know whether he had livestock or whether he had uh, 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 crops or whatever, he, but he had some commodity that he was dealing uh, to people. Uh, and he had a steward that was overseeing his household um, and the distribution of these things. And if you were such a landowner and if you were such a, a, an owner of, of these, uh, the, these commodities that was going out, would you be happy and commend him for being wise if he ripped you off for half of the money that was owed to you? Because that's what he did with the man that owed the oil. He said, uh, write your bill to 50%. And of course, the condition was that he paid right away. And uh, uh, well, hence the word quickly. Let's do this quick. Um, and the other was a little different, but he owed something else. Uh, but uh, 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 he had to pay back a, a portion uh, of it, the greater portion, but then he discounted it quite a bit. Now, why would the owner, why would the master be happy with that if it cut into his, uh, uh, his wealth? That would be the very definition of, of uh, being a, uh, what, did, what, what did he say? Uh, uh, wasting his goods. Would that not be the very definition of waste? He's accused of wasting his goods. So he goes out and wastes more goods. And then the master says, oh, great job. I don't think that's how we're supposed to understand this. Because that, that just absolutely doesn't make any sense. Now, what I read this morning was from uh, Harry Ironside. I've got a few commentators that I, uh, that I really like that I go to often. And that's Harry Ironside. One's Warren Wiersbe and the other one is Matthew Henry. Uh, which is very popular, uh, um, um, has been popular for years. But uh, at any rate, I was uh, uh, interested in what uh, Iron, Ironside had to say about this. And uh, what, it, what he said was the key thing into understanding this passage, this story, is to understand what a steward was in that day and what he did. He wasn't just a butler. He wasn't just a, uh, someone who took care of just the house. This man took care of the affairs of the Lord, of the Master. So the distribution of his goods, he saw to it that it was done. The accusation was that he was wasting it. How was he wasting it? In what way was he wasting it? Could it be that he was letting people have the goods without paying for them? And whenever he said, gave him say, uh, you're going to bring the books and we're going to find, you're going to give an accounting of your stewardship and we're going to get to the bottom of this. Uh, and then he says, you know, I'm going to get fired. Well, why, is he going, why does he know he's going to get fired? Because he knows that he's been letting people have his master's goods without paying anything. And the reason he would do that is because a little bit of an economy, a local economy within that household, uh, it might have been common with any stewardship like this in, 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 in this way. The master, the owner of the place, didn't care how much the steward charged for the goods as long as he got what 
the value of it was, the market value. So the steward might be compelled to try and sell for a little bit more, and he would take that off the top for himself. That was fine, as long as the master got what was his. Uh, the only problem is, and this is, uh, this is uh, uh, perhaps implied, so don't take it, so take it as a, a grain of salt, uh, but uh, uh, it could be that what this steward was doing was charging a higher price than what he normally would have charged on credit to allow them to take what, uh, what goods his master had and uh, on the promise of giving more wealth and that would make him more wealthy. But when it came time to reckon the books, he would fall way short. So whenever he calls up his debtors and he says, how much do you owe? And then mark that down 50%. It's most likely because he had marked it up 50%. So whenever he gives this discount, what he's doing is he's forfeiting the part of that transaction that would benefit him. And he's giving the master, though, what belonged to the master, but he's also making friends by cutting the price down and saying, if you pay today, you only got to pay 50%. And why, who, who wouldn't jump on that? And so, uh, but in doing so, he forfeits what would immediately benefit him for what might benefit him in the future. And that's, that's, that's what's going on here. So there is, it's not nearly as confusing that way when you think of it in those terms. Uh, and it's another mistake I made, and I can't believe this, it's one of those things that, you know, where uh, you just overlook something real simple. And for some reason, in my mind, when I read that story, and it says the Lord commended uh, the unjust steward, I thought it meant the Lord, or it was saying the Lord, Jesus was commending, and said that that uh, hey, the uh, uh, you know the, the the children of this world have more wisdom when it comes to uh, when it comes to wealth than than the children of the kingdom. Uh, those words may have been Jesus. But it wasn't, it wasn't the Lord Jesus that commended the unjust steward. It was the master, his Lord, commended him for what he had done. Um, so that's another mistake that, that some people make. Uh, uh, apparently that's not as widespread as I once thought because I was sharing that with my wife this morning and she looked at me like I was dumb. And it was like, well, I never thought that was talking about the Lord Jesus. I thought it was talking about the master. <laughs> I, huh? So I guess I'm the only one that thought that. <laughs> but, but anyways, it, it makes so much more sense when you view this story uh, in, in that light. Uh, the steward was forfeiting his cut in order to make friends. And uh, so he would have a place to go. And in doing so, he eliminated the problem that he was having uh, with wasting his master's goods because he got the books leveled out and he got everything squared away. And that's what he was accused of to begin with. So it clears things up to know, you know exactly what we're talking about when we're talking about a steward. Uh, it's interesting that uh, the passage that Phil used this morning also used that term. Uh, and, and this is what we are. Uh, um, you know, we, we give, or most of, I mean, most of the time we give 10% of our income uh, to, to the church, to the Lord's church. Um, and uh, uh, at, the very, at the very least, w you know, we might use that as an example uh, to give uh, consistently. It might be more than 10%. It might be a little less than 10%. I don't know any of you's personal income to know that or anything like that. But um, we, we do this, and, but we don't need to make the mistake of thinking, well, I gave the Lord his, the rest of this is mine. <laughs> I'm going to do this what I want. Because in reality, all of it is our Lord's. 
All of it is our master's. And we're stewards of it. It doesn't belong to us. Because at the end of the day, we can't take it with us. It's not ours. Someone else will come and take all the wealth that we've accumulated in this life. Someone else will take it up after us. And um, that's just the way this works. So what it boils down to is we are, in fact, stewards uh, of what we've been blessed with. And uh, so that's what he's going to get at here in a moment. But, but uh, uh, this is the same mentality that we should have uh, with our wealth is that it belongs to the Lord. Not just 10%, but all of it belongs to the Lord. And uh, uh, we're, just, we're just taking care of the things that he's blessed us with. And uh, uh, when we move on in the chapter, excuse me, in verse 9, we get a, 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 an application for this teaching. Now, Jesus had just got through saying that the children of this world are in their generation wiser than the children of light. He says, and I, and I say unto you, make to yourselves friends of the mammon of unrighteousness. Now, what does he mean by mammon? That's not a term that we generally use in this day and age. Um, mammon is, a, uh, is the name of a false deity in uh, one of the pagan religions uh, who was the god of wealth. And it came to be a, I guess euphemism is the right term, uh, for wealth. They would call wealth mammon. So when it says mammon, it's just talking about wealth. But he's not just talking about wealth. He calls wealth unrighteous. He calls it unrighteous. I suppose that money, currency, is a thing that has developed and come, and come to be because, as a result of the fall. It's a necessary thing, unfortunately, but that's where it came from. Uh, the Bible tells us that it's the root of all kinds of evil. Uh, that the love of money, excuse me, the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. But money, wealth, is a tool, just like a lot of other things are a tool. It depends on what we do with them as to whether or not they're evil. Uh, inherent. I mean, there's no inherent evil there necessarily, but it's, but it's uh, typically what we do with it. And, uh, but he, he, he calls it uh, uh, mammon of unrighteousness. And he says, make to yourselves friends of the mammon of unrighteousness that when ye fail, ye may re he, they may receive you into everlasting habitations. He that is faithful, well, let's stop right there for a second because I've got to talk about that. That is a very confusing statement because you might wonder, what is Jesus saying? To buy yourself friends? And that's going to get you into heaven? On first glance, it might appear to say that, but that's not what it's saying at all. Um, what Jesus is telling, again, it's as an example, as an application of the example that he gave. Uh, and what he's saying is to use your wealth wisely. Uh, use your wealth to help other people. That's what we should use our wealth for. Jesus even said uh, in a few chapters prior to this, he talks about um, uh, uh, there was a wealthy man that asked, you know, how to get to heaven. And, and Jesus talks about that uh, for, for, for a bit. And, and um, he says there to, uh, uh, to sell what you have and, and give alms, you know, help other people. And he said, and you set yourself treasures in heaven so that where your treasure is, there your heart will be. Now, um, he's talking about using your wealth to help other people, to benefit other people. In order to do that, you have to forfeit what benefit it might have to you directly. Just like that steward had to forfeit what benefit that wealth might have given him, he forfeited that in order to establish a friendship. Now, it came from selfish motives and selfish reason, reasons, but the idea is, it, it should be the same, uh, that we should be willing to use what God has blessed us with. It doesn't have to be money, but whatever He's used to bless us with, we are to use that to benefit and to help other people. And by doing so, you are doing things that will, that will, be, uh, that, that, that will be present that will last 
through eternity. And that's what he's saying about uh, they, when you fail or when you, when you die, they may receive you into everlasting habitations. They might not necessarily be people, but it could be, but it could be your treasures. Those, those things that you've done to help other people, it involves them most definitely. And, and when you get to glory, you might see some of those things, some of those people that you helped that you might not even realize the depth of the uh, 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 impact that your help had on those folks. And you might not even realize it until then and, and that day. And, and the Lord rewards you for it. Um, so that's what Jesus is talking about there. He's not talking about buying friends to benefit you in the same selfish manner as the steward. He's simply talking about being good stewards with the wealth that God gave you so that it may benefit others. And that will carry over into eternity. It's the same teaching he already taught about laying up yourself treasures in heaven. Uh, not here on the earth where the moth and rust corrupts, but lay them up in heaven where they'll be there for all eternity. Um, he that is faithful in that which is least. Now isn't it interesting that Jesus calls wealth least? Uh, money is a little thing to God. A small thing. Uh, he doesn't think too highly of it. Um, he that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much. But if you're faithful with your wealth, if you do what is right with your wealth, that indicates that you are fit to receive something even greater than wealth. And that's the kind of thing that God gives. Something that surpasses and is greater that had, you can't put in monetary value on it. Um, he that is faithful uh, in that which is least is faithful also in much. And he that is unjust in least is un unjust also in much. If therefore ye have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to your trust the true riches? So is money, is wealth, is it true riches? No, that's unrighteous mammon. But what Jesus is saying, if you do right by the material blessings that God has given you, then you prove yourself to be fit to be entrusted with true riches. Now, the, what are the true riches? It doesn't matter what they are specifically. Just that the Lord identifies them as true riches. I don't care what they are. If the Lord says I'll, I'm, you'll be blessed with true riches, whatever that is, I'd like some. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't matter what it is. Uh, uh, and uh, he says... If you have not been faithful in that which is another man's, who shall give you that which is your own? So if you're not faithful with what belongs to another, you aren't fit to have that which belongs to you. And that's where we are right now. And, and, and technically speaking, nothing, none of this belongs to us. Uh, we can't take it with us. We're stewards of it. It's all, it all belongs to God. But we need to be faithful with it. And when we're faithful with it, He'll bless us with spiritual blessings that we can't even comprehend. And then He goes on to say this. Um, no servant can serve two masters. Now, when you first read, at first reading and you get to that verse, it seems like Jesus is contradicting Himself maybe. Uh, that He's talking about you know, doing all the good things with money, and then he says, uh, but you can't serve, you know, well, you can't serve this. You've got to serve God. But he's not inconsistent at all with, it, with anything that he's taught here. No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Now, understand what he's saying here. He does not say you should not serve God and mammon. He says you cannot it's something that can't happen. It's almost like going east and west. You can't go east and west. You have to pick one. You can, you can go east or you can go west, but you can't do both. Um, the, the, this is similar to, to that. You can serve God or you can serve money, wealth, but you can't serve both. Uh, you'll, you'll love the one and despise the other. So what's the proper view of wealth for a Christian in this day and age? Uh, 
He doesn't say to shun wealth, does he? He says to use it properly and to put it in its proper perspective, in its proper place. Um, I heard something. I put it in quotes. I don't even know who said it, but I thought it was interesting. Uh, he said, if God is your master, wealth is your servant. Uh, but that's not where he ended it. He also said, if wealth is your master, you try to make God your servant. You can't. God won't be your servant, but that's how you treat it. God becomes, Lord, give me this. Lord, bless me with that. Lord, give me... And, and, it be, and God becomes a means for you to acquire things. So you can have more wealth. And you try to make God your personal servant, and it will not happen. It won't happen that way. But if, you make, if, 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 if God is your master, and you treat Him as your master, then wealth becomes your tool. Wealth becomes your servant, a thing that you use uh, uh, to, uh, 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 to the benefit, to the glory of God. And that's, that's the proper way to think of this wealth. Now, that certainly isn't what the younger, the, the younger son did in the, in the first story. And that absolutely it isn't even what the Pharisee, I mean, not the Pharisee, the elder son, who was a picture of a Pharisee, I suppose, uh, did. Uh, uh, he hung on to his wealth and was bitter uh, about the treatment of, of the one that didn't. It was, uh, he was more of a, a busybody than anything else. But uh, there's a proper way, and that's what Jesus is showing here. Now in verse 14, uh, some Pharisees chime in. And because they're covetous, they desire material wealth and material goods, and they want more of it. And uh, part of what they do is to acquire more. It says, And the Pharisees also who were covetous heard all these things, and they derided him. And he said unto them, Ye are they which justify yourselves before men, but God knoweth your hearts. For that which is highly esteemed among men is a, an abomination in the sight of God. The law and the prophets were until John. Since that time, the kingdom of God is preached, and every man presseth into it. And it is easier for heaven and earth to pass than one tittle of the law to fail. Whosoever putteth away his wife and marrieth another committeth adultery, and whosoever marrieth her that is uh, put away from her husband committeth adultery. Now, why does Jesus say these things? They don't seem to be related to each other. Uh, but if we look to the other Gospels, we understand there was a lot more dialogue involved there, and Luke just condensed it down uh, uh, to some issues that these Pharisees were having personally. And uh, Jesus wants to stress uh, the... First of all, the fact that how they justify themselves in their own eyes by their deeds. And uh, second of all, how they, in trying and claiming and appearing to uphold the word of God, uh, they try to diminish it. And he told them this, uh, with your traditions, you diminish the, the word of God. And uh, 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 a tittle is a little... It looks like an apostrophe, but it's but it goes over a letter uh, in, in in Hebrew and in Greek, and that's what he's saying. Even the most insignificant thing in God's word, uh, just a little tiny mark of punctuation, not even that will perish. Uh, it's easier for the heaven and earth to perish than it is for the law of God. Uh, so again, he he brings up something uh, that is that has value in it that surpasses even material wealth. And that is God's Word. Um, then, I uh, have very little time. I wish I had more time to cover these next verses because this portion of Scripture, to me, uh, has a wealth of knowledge. And uh, Jesus goes on to continue uh, speaking about wealth. And um, he says in 19, There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, Lazarus, uh, which was laid at his gate full of sores, and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. It sounds like a very miserable life for the man that was poor. And uh, uh, the thought occurred to me this morning, just a what if. What if the rich man is the same as the master in the first story? 
you know, and what if we're getting a little bit of a glimpse into his, how things fared for him? I don't know, it's just a thought. But it, it could be any wealthy person that, that walks by uh, someone in need. Um, also, I have to mention this, when it comes to benevolence, when it comes to alms, Jesus never said, never endorsed to have your government do this for you. Whenever there was a problem, whenever there was something like this rich man, it was the rich man should have helped this poor man directly. When we see the Good Samaritan, we see a man that helped someone in need that was beaten and robbed on the side of the road. We don't see a man who goes to the government and says we need to start a government program to take money from other people to help people that are beat up on the side of the road. Uh, to, in my mind, that very thing that they think is service to God is the exact opposite. Uh, God never endorsed you taking someone else's wealth to help someone else in need. He always endorsed you doing what you could do to help that person. And that's the way it should be handled. Uh, any, any, uh, but we have a tendency to do that, don't we? Even when we might do it ourselves, we tend to resent the people that don't. We tend to wag our finger at the people that don't and say, why ain't you helping? Look at me, I'm helping. I'm doing things good. You're a dirty, rotten person for not helping. We have a tendency to do that. But that's not God's way. God's way is when you see a need, you help that person. You use what God's benefited you with to help them. Uh, it's not this idea of uh, uh, delegating that to another agency. He says, and there was a certain, oh, excuse me, I'm going backward. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. Uh, the rich man also died and was buried. And in hell he lifted up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. Send Lazarus. Now, now he's treating Lazarus like a servant, actually. You know, Lazarus was a beggar. He knew his name, even. But he walked by and he didn't help him. He didn't have anything to eat. Dogs licked his sores. He was in a very, very poor state. And now he's like, send Lazarus over here to help me. And uh, he says that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. Now, but now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. And beside all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us uh, that would come from thence. So in this scenario, we have... A place where at that particular stage in history the dead went and one place and we understand was a place of comfort and the place of peace and it's named Abraham's bosom and the other place was a place of torment now in the place of torment there's flame there's hot and there's thirst and the rich man says, let Lazarus come, just stick his finger in some water and wet my tongue because uh, it's, it's miserable over here. And uh, Abraham reminded him of the riches that he enjoyed while he was here on the earth, but he paid no mind to the riches in glory. And now, even if he wanted to, he said, there's a great gulf between us that you can't come over here and we can't go over there. It's just the way it is. And it says, And then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house. For I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. Now, now he asked something different. Now he's finally thinking about other people. But he's thinking about the people that are living the people that he cared about. And he, he says, can you send Lazarus back to my father's house? I got five brothers and they need to be warned 
that not to come to this place, and um, which is commendable, but very sad. Very sad that a person has to come to this place in hell, in torment, before they start thinking about sharing the good news of the gospel. Isn't that sad? I mean, why, why would they not do it while they were here? Why didn't they could do it themselves? But it does, things don't work that way. All of, his, all of his dreams, goals, and ambition was fixated on the things he had acquired in this life. And he wasn't giving any thought to what comes after. And he says in verse 29, that Abraham said unto him, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. Now Moses and the prophets were the scriptures of that time. Moses was the first five books, and then you have the prophetic books. Uh, and that's what, he, that's what the scriptures was called, Moses and the prophets. And uh, Jesus is, uh, uh, excuse me, uh, Abraham is saying, Lazarus don't need to go back. Your brothers have the scriptures. They have the Bible. You know, that's true today. I, I, I still, I think that the Bible, the King James Bible specifically, is the most printed book uh, in America, in the United States. Uh, and it's probably the least read. But uh, we, nobody is... In this country, I think, with an excuse, because not only do we have Bibles on every shelf and every, you know, all, all across the, I mean, you can buy a Bible even in a grocery store, um, but we also have churches on every corner. Now, not every church is perfect, and I have issues with a lot of doctrine that other denominations espouse that I believe is false and is destructive toward the gospel. Um, but even so, they could go and get some measure of the, of the Bible, the, you know, somewhere. There's some, a place to go uh, to get God's truth, but they don't do it and they won't do it. Uh, but what a shame it would be to wait until you're in hell before you even start to think about such things. Uh, it's important to think about them now. And... Also, it emphasizes the power in the Word of God. Abraham says they have the Scriptures. They can hear those. And the rich man says in verse 30, And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. If they saw somebody rise from the dead, they would change their mind at such a sight. You would think that, wouldn't you? But we know what happened. Jesus did that very thing. Matter of fact, he said he would do it before he did it. And what their response was, let's stop it. Let's put some guards at the tomb. And let's make sure this doesn't happen. Uh, that's, that, that was their intent. But we do. We do have a man who came from the dead to confirm the message that's been preached for 2,000 years and longer because it was preached before Jesus came on the scene. It's just they didn't exactly know how it was going to uh, transpire. But it was preached. The gospel was preached even to Abraham, the Scripture said. But uh, uh, nevertheless, you would think that one would believe if you saw someone rise from the dead, but they don't. They still don't believe. So the problem with unbelief is not a lack of miracles. The problem with unbelief is a hard, unrepentant heart. That's the problem with unbelief. And no amount of evidence can make them change their mind. They're delusional. And, and the only thing that can, that can even have a chance to penetrate that, that cold rocky, that cold stone of a heart, is the Spirit of God. A direct intervention by the Spirit of God into the heart of a man. And, um, but he's thinking if someone came back from the dead, they would surely repent. They would surely believe. And here's what Abraham said, and it's really astonishing when you think about it. Like I said, it, it, it really speaks to the power that is in the Word of God. And he said unto them, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. So as Jesus is speaking about wealth here, 
as he's telling them to set themselves up with treasures in heaven, as he's telling us to make good use of our wealth and use it in a godly manner uh, um, so that we can benefit from it in, in glory. Um, he shares another truth. And he mentions it to the Pharisees in mid, midway and tells them that it would be easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for one tiny little dot or dash to disappear out of the Scriptures. It, it would be easier for that to happen. And, and um, then here, again, he's telling the story about how wealth does not do anything for you uh, when your life is expired and when, when, you, when you live no more. You can't take that wealth with you. But the truth still shines through that the most valuable riches that one can have is God and His Word. There's nothing more rich than that. And there's nothing more valuable than that. And if you have God in your life and you have the assurances of His Word, there is no greater treasure than that. And it even echoes through eternity. Here we see it. Even, even in the life that comes after this one, it is still paramount. It is even more powerful and more valid than if a man came back from the dead and told you, ah, I just came from hell and you don't want to go there. You know, I saw what it was like. Even if a guy came with that testimony, even if a guy came with a testimony and said, hey, I just died, came from heaven, that's the place you want to go. It's great, it's wonderful there, it's not like hell. It doesn't matter. The testimony of God's Word is greater than that. Isn't that amazing? So it, it just, it, I, we ought to be ashamed of how little we, what value we place on it. Uh, not just you and I, but as a people. Um, I firmly believe that this is what's wrong with, with the world, is a departure from His Word. It was like what you were sharing in Sunday school. And, and uh, you see things like the most absurd thoughts that a person could possibly have is put forth as reasonable. Like this. Like men or young men should be able to use the girls, the young girls, the young women's facilities. For example, just an example, any right thinking individual will say that is a horrible idea because you know what you're going to have. We just had it. It happened. It's probably happened more than this, but at least this was publicized. Uh, a young lady was raped in the locker room by a, 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 a guy because it was the school board's policy to allow guys into the girls' locker area. And the young girl was raped there. And then, of course, what happens when the father goes to the school board meeting to say, hey, look what happened. They arrest him and call him a domestic terrorist. And, um, but why? You know, why all this lunacy? Why is lunacy in our day and age being given so much credence? You know, I don't think I like the labels that we're given to use for each other. I don't think I like the term left and right. I don't think I like the terms liberal and conservative. I like the term righteousness and wickedness. I like the term lunacy. For what it is, it's lunacy. It's lunacy to think that you can put young men in a locker room and change them clothes with and showering with young men and nothing bad's going to happen. Are you stupid? That's I think they are. I, I believe it's a mental disorder, honestly. What we commonly call let leftism, but but that's beside the point. I think that the biggest problem, the biggest problem we have as we have neglected God's word and said this is, we've said to our society, we've said to our, our, our youth, this is of little value. Right. In, so, in some instances, in many instances, this is of no value. Yeah. And then they wonder, why is this happening? Yeah. 
Why are people just shooting up people randomly? Oh, I know, it's because of guns. If there wasn't any guns, it wouldn't happen. Well, then they start cutting up people with knives. And then they think, well, we need to outlaw knives. Now they're shooting people with bow and arrows. Have you seen that? I forget who it was. It might have been in Europe somewhere. I can't remember. But there was somebody, a crazed individual, that starts shooting people with, with arrows. The problem is not guns and arrows and knives. The problem is a departure from God and from His Word. Its value is, is, is higher than anything on this earth. Any wealth, any, any amount of money, any amount of, of uh, 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 material possessions you can think you could possibly amass. Uh, there is nothing that compares to the richness and to the value of God's Word. And that's, that's the thing that we need to have as believers. Uh, we can have money. We can have wealth. We need to rightfully use it. But we need to be sure that we place the proper value on God's Word. Because it's within that. The, the Bible tells us the Gospel is the power of God and the salvation. And the Gospel is the spoken, is the written, it's, 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 it's in this book from cover to cover. Uh, the, 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 the message of the Gospel in some way, shape, fashion, or form is here. And it's that message that, that has the power in it to transform a person's life and to change them from a hell-bound sinner to a heaven-bound saint. And it's that that has more value than anything else. And we as believers uh, should, uh, should value it above all the world's riches. And uh, uh, I, you know, I hope that we can do that. I hope that we endeavor to do that. If we, if we are, I hope we can do it more. But let, let that be our goal, uh, to value, to place the proper value on, on our relationship with God uh, and His Word. Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, we're grateful to You, and we thank You, Lord, for the examples, Lord, that You've given us from Your servant, Luke. And I pray, Lord, that You would help us to uh, place proper value on Your Word. And I pray, Father, You'd help us to not look so much toward riches uh, in, in this life or, or, or material gain in any way. But we do thank you, Lord. We do enjoy a great many things. Um, we live as, as kings and queens uh, as in comparison to, to, to people in times past and in other places in this world today. And Lord, I can't help but think that we take it for granted and I can't help but think of how ugly our complaints are uh, whenever we don't get the things that we think we need. And Lord, I pray that you'd help us to treasure and to value your word as we should. And if anybody's hearing this message, Lord, and they don't know where they're going to go whenever they leave this life, and they might end up in that place where that rich man went, I pray, Lord, that they might come to you and they, that they might believe in the gospel and that they might believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and trust in him as their Savior. We ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right, let's go ahead and stand.